Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Saturius Johnson. If you're an animal lover, you're in luck today. Rick Schwartz, ambassador for the San Diego Zoo and San Diego Zoo Safari Park, will take us behind the scenes at these two outstanding attractions. Could you imagine basically waking up to the sounds of lions doing their morning roar to mark their territory? Because that happens. Yeah, we have a camp site basically on grounds at the safari park, so you can do the overnight roar and snore there. We'll also head north to Mount Shasta and talk to a man who leads spiritual tours on this imposing landmark. I think when you come to Mount Shasta, you, you remember that the happiness is already inside of you, and you don't need a bigger house or more money in your bank account. You can just be happy right now. Plus, we'll explore the town of Bishop, a hidden gem nestled in the Eastern Sierra. It's all coming up on California Now. Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. You may know my next guest from his many national TV appearances, including The Today Show, Good Morning America, Live with Kelly, and a very funny recent segment on The Late Late Show with James Corden. Rick Schwartz is spokesperson and ambassador for San Diego Zoo Global, the nonprofit organization that runs both the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. He helps visitors connect with the many amazing animals at the two facilities, and he also spreads the word about its groundbreaking conservation efforts around the world. Welcome to the California Now podcast, Rick. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, you know, I've always thought that the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park were tourist attractions that did some conservation work on the side. But as I conducted research ahead of this interview, I began to realize that I actually had it backward. It seems pretty clear to me now that the San Diego Zoo Global Organization is a conservation-minded organization first and foremost. Is that how you see things? Yeah, absolutely. Especially, uh, you know, in this modern era. Uh, the, the challenge we face, honestly, though, is we try to put out all this great information about this wonderful science and conservation we're doing in the immediate round. They just want a cute picture of a baby animal. <laughs> so a lot of people don't know. A lot of people are similar to you, that they, they know as a, as a zoo that's wonderful to go visit or a safari park that is great for experiences. And, and a wonderful place for the family. And then once they're there, they tend to learn about that conservation or, or if, like yourself, do some more research on it, realize that we are very much a nonprofit conservation organization that also just happens to run these world-class facilities you can come visit. You know, the, the zoo's work to help save the California condor is truly inspirational. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, my gosh, I can tell you a lot about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, for, for anybody who, who's not aware, uh, back in the 1980s, there were only 22 individual California condors left on this planet. And with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, State of California, and a few other uh, organizations, we all got together and came up with a plan to bring them in from the wild, which unfortunately did mean that they were technically extinct in the wild because now they're under human care. But because of the crisis of their population dropping uh, due to human activity, we knew that if we didn't do something soon, we'd lose them all together. So uh, now fast forward to today with all the science and work and technology that's been put into a breeding program that's successful, we've gone from 22 individuals to over uh, 450 in the population and about half of that flying free back out in the wild. Now, this species is still considered an endangered species, uh, but they are on the right path. You know, they're heading the right direction, at least. So we're excited about that. That's really great. If you don't mind, I'd like to rewind for a second and hear about your trajectory with the San Diego Zoo. When did you start and how did your role evolve over time? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you said we only have 15 minutes for the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been quite an interesting process and one that I don't, I don't think I could have written a script for. But looking back on it, everything in my life seemed to fall right into place to place me where I am today. Uh, my passion, my background, my, my life has always been about uh, wildlife and animal behavior. And, and being surrounded by animals is just, as soon as I found you could have a career working with animals, uh, I was like, that's where I'm going. Um, <laughs> and I set my sights on that when I was in middle school and went to college to become an animal care specialist and animal trainer and have done it my entire life. I had about seven and a half years of experience behind me before applying to the San Diego Zoo. Uh, it is a very popular place for people in my line of work to want to work. So it took about seven applications before I even got an interview. <laughs> and uh, even then I didn't get that job. It wasn't until the next job then that uh, I was able to get hired on as a part-time keeper in the children's zoo. And I was happy there. I could have retired there. But then in uh, about uh, nine years into my career, an opportunity opened up to become a, a spokesperson role. It was temporary, and I was supposed to go back to my keeper role when it was done. 
Long story short, I ended up staying on permanently as a spokesperson for the organization. <laughs> so my experience, my knowledge, and my passion is, is that the connection we have with nature and with wildlife and how in our modern times it's, it's kind of slipped away in some areas. And I see when I do present, uh, I get to see those people, you know, people lean in. They, they want that connection back. There's a natural curiosity we have for wildlife. And once people learn about it, uh, they want to help. What would you say is the best part of your job? Oh, Gosh, there's two. There's two parts to that. There are quiet, intimate, one-on-one moments with the animals that I get to, to work with. That uh, for me, uh, as an individual who've, who's always enjoyed that time with animals, you know, that, that is the, the best moment there is that, that just time where it's just the two of you and you can connect and, and feel that, that bond. Uh, there's something very special about that to me. And then the other part that is equally as best is when I have one of my animal friends with me and there's a family or there's a kid or even an adult, honestly, and you can see it in their eyes. You know, because mm. I'm the one with the animal, they're looking towards me. They're not looking at me, but they're looking towards me. And I can see it in the body language. I can see it in the face when they have that moment where they just they feel the connection or they, they have that aha moment where they want to learn more. And they're absolutely fascinated by what, for me, is a, is a daily thing. And that is really special, too, when I know I've reached that person and possibly have them on my side to, to start looking at the world a little bit differently with a little more appreciation for wildlife. Now, are there, are there certain animals that are particularly great ambassadors for the zoo? It's one of those things where it's actually based more on personality than it is to say this particular species is better than that species. You know, in my career that spans... <laughs> a couple of decades, I've worked with a lot of different species and and many individuals within the same species. And I can tell you, and it's kind of funny, people are sometimes surprised to hear this, but even within the same species, uh, each individual definitely has their own personality and characteristics, (laughs) likes and dislikes. And so it's one of those things where uh, you might have a meerkat or a a particular parrot that is just a wonderful ambassador, loves being around people, but then there's a another meerkat that you work with that does not care for people. You know, one one that comes to mind is we have a koala we had several years ago, a male koala that, and it, keep in mind, the koalas in general prefer to, they're fairly indifferent to people. Um, but even as a youngster, he would crawl off his mom to go see the, what the keepers were doing, which is an unusual behavior. Usually koalas like to stay with mom. But he was always naturally curious about his keepers, and so we got permission to see if he would be a good candidate to be an ambassador. What that means is we start working with them more hands-on and, and seeing how they react to either traveling or being different parts of the zoo or being with people. And, uh, you know, he was an individual that over the years, and he and I traveled quite a bit together to help talk about uh, koala conservation and the work that we're doing over there. Uh, And he was amazing. I, I was always dumbfounded by... Just his natural curiosity of, of different people, what was going on around him in the environment, whether we were in a studio, he would look around to see what all these, you know, these crazy animals wearing clothes, what are they doing? Um, or, you know, there was one time that comes to mind, we were in, in New York in a green room and, you know, studios in New York, they aren't TV studios like in Los Angeles. These are in skyscrapers usually. And we were several floors up and he was in his perch just kind of hanging out, looking out the window at New York. And it was just this amazing moment to see this koala just taking New York in from the skyline. You know, it was beautiful. So uh, it's more about the individual character and personality of the animal than it is the species. That's interesting. Yeah, I know you can't give personal behind-the-scenes tours to everybody who wants to get up close to these animals, but the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park both offer experiences uh, that give visitors an enhanced perspective on these animals. So starting with the Safari Park, can you tell us about one or two of these programs? Oh, my goodness. The best way to present that is to say that they are uh, they are always changing. So uh, for anybody listening now, whatever I might tell you about, please double check with the website because a lot of these tours change as our animals change. So as an organization, we work with many other zoos. Uh, we have babies born. We send those babies off or the adults off to other facilities for other breeding purposes or, of course, because they're animals, some do pass away in time. So a lot of our tours are kind of changing and different. Some of my favorite one that are themed series sort of is our breakfast with and then fill in the blank. So we have breakfast with penguins at the zoo or we have breakfast with um, tigers at the safari park. And we have uh, a full catering, um, you know, department within our organization that makes up these wonderful meals. And it's a sit down meal in a special designated area that is before we open to the public. And you kind of have not only the special breakfast with the through the glass, then you have either the penguins or, or the tigers. Uh, but then you have an opportunity to, we have educators and keepers there too, to discuss and talk about that actual species. There's other tours too at the Safari Park that I really enjoy. One of my favorites is our, our caravan safari. For those who aren't familiar with uh, the difference between the zoo and the Safari Park, the zoo is 100 acres near downtown uh, San Diego. The Safari Park is about a 45, 50 minute drive to the north. 
and it's about 1,800 acres, so much, much larger. W one habitat for the animals might be 60, 50 to 60 acres. Wow. So the caravan safari, you get to get in the back of a truck with a guide and about, again, 10, 14 other people, depending on how many people bought into the tour. And the truck drives into the field enclosure, into the habitat there, and the animals come up to it because they know that there's food there and there's fun things to have. So <laughs> it's it's like being on safari in Africa, but you didn't have to buy the ticket or have your passport. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's all these great experiences. And I can't say it enough. you got to go to the website and check out what some of these options are for these tours because another one I'll get is, is well, what's, your, what's the best one? And it's like, well, the best one really is what speaks to you and your personal interests. If you want to learn more about koalas, there's probably a behind-the-scenes tour for koalas that includes a few other Australian animals. Maybe your thing is you really want to be around giraffe. Well, there's probably a tour for that too, to your own personal interest. And it sounds like there are, there are so many different ones. You will find one that, that appeals to you. I mean... Do you also have kind of like overnight experiences, kind of like a night at the museum or a night at the safari? Yeah, could you imagine... Um, basically waking up to the sounds of lions doing their morning roar uh, to mark their <laughs> territory because that happens uh, yeah we have uh, the, the we have the a camp site basically on grounds at the safari park so you can do the overnight roar and snore there and it's not like you're just in a sleeping bag on the ground we have nice safari tents that are set up with cots all the way up to you can upgrade to a full mattress if you wanted and uh, you overnight it's catered uh, you have dinner and breakfast and again because you're there at those hours after we close to the public and before the public opens, you get some special behind-the-scenes tours as a part of that as well. That sounds really fantastic. You know, be before we wrap up, uh, do you have any pro tips for visitors? Is there a best time of day to visit, or is there some hidden gem at either of these parks people really should know about? Uh, here's a pro tip. If you have a favorite animal, go see it first. If there's a must-see animal on your list, like I don't care what else we see as long as we see the lions today, go there first because most animals are going to be pretty much their most active in the morning and the evening hours. Midday, they're going to be taking their siesta. They're smart. They're, <laughs> it's time to take a nap in the middle of the day. It's a natural thing for them. So first thing, plot out no matter what's closest or whatever. If you have a, a must-see animal, go see it first. And that way, if for any reason that animal isn't out at that time or uh, maybe they aren't active at that time, you can plan to come back in about an hour. Go see some other things and come back in an hour to see if they're active yet. Um, but if you wait till later in the day, a lot of times the animals are sleeping midday or at the end of day or you're exhausted by the end of day and you're like, you know what, I don't want to walk all the way over there to see them. Um, so that's my pro tip there. Comfortable shoes. Go see your favorite animal first. Um, another pro tip, if you're going to go to the zoo, we have a guided bus tour. Um, and at the safari park, we have the guided tram tour that are part of your purchase getting into the facilities. Go on that early, uh, maybe right after seeing your favorite animal. Go on that tram ride or the bus ride early in the day because the longer the day goes on, the longer the line gets. And you end up spending more and more time in line waiting for the tour than you would being out and about seeing things. So to avoid getting uh, losing time in line, I always recommend go there early. And then, of course, it's San Diego. We have wonderful, mild temperatures all day long, but the sun will get you, especially if you're from out of town and you're not used to it. You think, oh, I'm cool, I'm fine, I don't need sunscreen. So comfortable shoes and sunscreen. Listen to your mom. She was right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, this is all great to know. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the California Now podcast, Rick. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Rick Schwartz is spokesperson and ambassador for the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, serving as a liaison between the animals and the people who love them. If you're an animal lover and on Instagram, here are three essential follows, at San Diego Zoo, at SDZ Safari Park, and Rick's personal account, at Zookeeper Rick. As always, you can find links to all of the programs we discussed today on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. My next guest has written 14 California guidebooks and hundreds of articles about the Golden State for publications such as Sunset, Backpacker, and Travel and Leisure. Along the way, Anne Marie Brown has traveled extensively and has gotten to know every nook and cranny of the state, including some real hidden gems. Today, we're going to talk to her about one of her favorite places to visit, the Inyo County town of Bishop. Welcome back to the podcast, Anne Marie. Thank you, Satirius. So we're trying something a bit new here. Everybody knows about San Diego and Los Angeles and San Francisco, but there are so many fantastic cities and towns scattered all over the state that we want to highlight some lesser-known destinations, places that are well off the beaten path. So today we're going to learn about the city of Bishop. So tell us, where exactly is Bishop and how do we get there? 
Sure. Well, if you're coming from Los Angeles, you're looking at about a four-hour drive to get to Bishop. It's on the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountains. So if you know where US 395 is, big US highway going up and down the eastern Sierra, Bishop is right alongside that highway. The resort town of Mammoth Lakes is about 45 minutes north of Bishop, so it's not too far from there. If you were coming from Yosemite in the north, it's about a two-hour drive. So if you're kind of going to one of these better-known destinations, making a little side trip to Bishop is not too far out of the way. Absolutely not, and I would recommend it. So so what makes Bishop so special? Californians think of of Bishop as the place to go look at aspen trees in the fall. It's really well known for its aspen groves up in Bishop Creek Canyon. And from about late September until late October, crowds show up to see those beautiful trees turn golden, red, orange. It's really quite a sight to see. But year-round, Bishop is an amazing outdoor destination. Do you know anything about the history of the place? Yeah, you know, Bishop is a lot like a lot of other places places in California where mining played a really big role in its history. It got its start because miners and prospectors were moving into the area, into the Owens Valley, uh, to look for ore, and they were finding it. So as the mines were established, the miners needed stock animals, they needed food, they needed supplies, and Bishop was kind of the closest place nearby that had dependable water, really pretty good weather, And so it was a natural place for ranching and agriculture. Bishop was founded by a a guy named Samuel Bishop in the 1860s, and he brought a bunch of cattle into the region, and he started a ranch to supply the mines. So why don't you describe for us what it physically looks like? Like, let's let's say you're waking up in a little bed and breakfast in town, and you pull back the curtains, and you you look around. What would you be seeing? Well, Bishop is kind of a classic old Western-looking town. It's not not particularly large. Only about 4,000 people live there year-round, and that's including the outline areas. So we have a lot of historic buildings in Bishop. And when you open those curtains and look out the window, what you're going to see are the highest peaks of the Sierra Nevada. You're looking at the southern Sierra Nevada, where the mountains are 13,000, 14,000 feet high. And even though they're a little bit in the distance, you can actually drive to them in less than half an hour. So you're looking at beautiful mountains, I'm sure like lots of trees, as well as a charming kind of like Main Street area. Yeah, there's a lovely Main Street area. And honestly, not that many trees because Bishop is in the lower valley. So it's almost got more of the desert influence than the mountain influence, but it's situated right next to those mountains. So it's it's one of those edge towns that's got a little bit of both going on there. And the nice thing about that is that it keeps the weather there nice year round. Bishop itself doesn't get a tremendous amount of snow, but it's very, very close to the snow. So, so who else would be staying in this bed and breakfast? Like what kind of visitors are drawn to Bishop and, and what are they there to do? Well, I think first and foremost, foremost, um, Bishop is an outdoors enthusiast town. If you're a hiker, if you're a backpacker, if you're a rock climber, if you're an ice skater, <laughs> there's a tremendous amount to do in Bishop. You're going to see a lot of younger people and a lot of people who are outdoor lovers for sure. But the second part of that, which is a little bit surprising, and it's really just happened in the last decade, is that people who are serious about food are starting to make stops in Bishop because there are some really interesting places to eat there. Well, tell us about them. Absolutely. I, I'll talk about food all day long. Um, <laughs> one of my favorites is the is the Pupfish Cafe, which is actually inside a bookstore. It's inside the Spellbinder bookstore. And if you're an avocado toast fan, Pupfish Cafe does avocado toast, I don't know, six different ways. Uh, my favorite is the one with the smoked salmon on it. It's really something special. There's a new distillery in, in Bishop making small batch artesian spirits. It's called the Owens Valley Distilling Company. And honestly, the vodka is maybe the best vodka I've ever had. Their most popular drink there is the Bishop Mule, which is a kind of take on the Moscow Mule, of course. So that's a treat. There's there's surprising places. Like if you're in the mood for prime rib, the place to go, this again sounds a little bit nutty, but the place to go for prime rib is the bowling alley. <laughs> back of the Bishop, <laughs> the back of the Bishop Bowl has a restaurant called the Back Alley, and they are well known for their prime rib and their steaks. So that's kind of special. There's a lovely brewery in town called the Mountain Rambler, which makes wonderful locally made beers, plus some really intriguing food. They make a tempa Reuben sandwich. They make homemade sauerkraut, which they serve with 
just about everything. It's delicious. There's always live music playing there. And there are two awesome bakeries in town. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about bakeries. Eric Schatz is probably the most famous one, and that's right on the highway on US 395. Schatz is known for having shelves and shelves and shelves of bread, pastries, you name it. They've been making uh, the same sheep herder bread recipe since 1938. The recipe came from Basque sheep herders who moved into the Owens Valley to herd sheep during the gold rush. Interesting. Wow. They, yeah, they missed they missed their sheep herder bread, and so they <laughs> they started making it. And Schatz got the recipe, and and they've been producing the same recipe since 38. So that's really neat place to stop. And just around the corner, again off the main drag, so a lot of people miss it, is a Great Basin Bakery. And they make a wonderful sourdough. They make delicious molasses spice cookies. I'm salivating thinking about that. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's lots of good stuff to eat there. So, yeah, it's surprising how, uh, you know, these little towns that you don't really expect that you'd find much besides maybe, you know, a chain restaurant uh, have some wonderful, wonderful places to visit for a meal. Well, it sounds like it's almost worth a trip just to experience the food and drink in Bishop, but I'm sure there are other things that that people should be seeing and doing. So tell us about some (laughs) of the must-see attractions in Bishop. What are, say, like two or three things that a first-time visitor has to see or do. One of my absolute favorite places is the Laws Railroad Museum. You know, you hear the word museum, and I think you think, you know, dusty exhibits, maybe indoors, kind of dark, boring, right? No. This is outside. It's 11 acres large, and and the 11 acres hold 28 separate buildings, which are mostly tiny pioneer shacks. And you can go in a lot of them. You can look in the windows of other ones. They are crammed full of all kinds of pioneer curios. There's, you know, antique sewing machines. There's old cameras. There's 19th century dentist tools. So it's a really interesting museum where, you know, you're, you're actually up close and personal with a lot of these original pioneer flotsam and jetsam that they all were used at one time in the Owens Valley and, and around Bishop. It's a just a really fun, interesting place to go. So I'd say the Laws Railroad Museum is a must. I would say definitely driving out to the ancient Bristlecone Pine Forest is a must. It's a, it's a still a decent drive from Bishop. Bishop is the closest big town to the ancient Bristlecone Pine Forest, but it's still a good 45-minute drive up into the White Mountains, which are the mountain range that run parallel to the Sierra Nevada in that part of the state. So it's a long drive, but worth doing. You're going up there to see trees that are 3,000 years old, the oldest living trees on Earth, and they are incredibly photogenic. They're gnarled. They're twisted. They stand out against a blue sky. It's, you know, something super special for sure. What about a lesser known attraction or activity that only insiders know about? I have a lot of favorite hikes out of Bishop, and some of these honestly are family friendly. Any pretty much anyone with any level of fitness could do some of these hikes. Again, you're driving to 9,000 feet in elevation, so the air is pretty thin as soon as you get out of your car, but you don't have to do a lot of climbing once you start hiking to reach some really beautiful gem like lakes. And I'm thinking, for instance, out of Sabrina Lake, there's a two and a half mile, two and a half mile one way hike to Blue Lake, which is a long, beautiful cobalt blue lake with granite peaks all around, you know, snowfields lingering into August. And, you know, it's a five mile round trip you're looking at. So most people can easily do that in half a day. And that's just a, a beautiful, beautiful trip to take. More so when the aspens are turning colors in the fall, but at lovely at any time of the summer as well. You can hike to Bishop Pass. You can hike to Paiute Pass, which is another one of the passes that allows access to the rest of the Sierra Nevada mountains out of North Lake. And Paiute Pass is a relatively gentle climb. It only gains about 1,000 feet in elevation. So for a high mountainous hike, that's pretty doable. I've seen, I've seen kids as young as six on that trail. Sign me up. You know, Anne-Marie, this is all really great stuff. I feel Bishop is moving up on my to-do list. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) Do you have any last suggestions or tips for travelers thinking about heading to Bishop? Well, I think I think the most important thing is don't don't judge Bishop by what you see from the highway because there is so much more 
in that town that's just a block or so off of the main drag. And I think a lot of times people are in such a hurry to get to other places. Maybe they're in a hurry to get to Mammoth Lakes or they're in a hurry to get to Yosemite or they're in a hurry to get home to Los Angeles. And they miss all the special little hidden spots in this great Western town. So many great insights, Anne-Marie. We hope you'll come back and uh, tell us about some other hidden gems throughout the state. Thank you so much. Anne-Marie Brown is an accomplished author and journalist and a regular guest of this podcast. You can find information about her many books and articles at her website, annemariebrown.com. And if you want more details about any of the places we discussed today, go to our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. Mount Shasta is located at the southern end of the Cascade Range in Siskiyou County within the boundaries of the Shasta Trinity National Forest. It's 14,179 feet tall, making it the fifth tallest mountain in California, comprising an estimated volume of 85 cubic miles. It's a scenic playground for outdoor adventurers, but it's also a world-renowned spiritual destination that draws visitors from all over the globe. Andrew Ozer has been leading Mount Shasta retreats since 1982, and today we're going to talk to him about exploring the spiritual side of the mountain. Welcome to the California Now podcast, Andrew. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you today. So, you know, I've only seen Mount Shasta from a distance, and it's incredibly beautiful, but there's something truly special about this place, isn't there? That's definitely my experience and the experience of many thousands of people from around the world, that there's just an energy here that's different. You know, there's so many mountains that are beautiful. The Sierras are beautiful. The Cascades are beautiful, the Rockies are beautiful, but there's just an energy here that goes beyond the physical beauty. That's why people come from around the world to this humble little mountain village. What's your personal connection to Mount Shasta? Well, you know, I was very lucky. I came here for the first time when I was right out of college, actually back in the late 70s, and just really fell in love with the mountain. And I lived in Washington, D.C. for 14 years and San Diego for 12 years, but Every year, I just had to get here for my recharge and my reset, since there was something I found here that I didn't find anyplace else. So I just came here for a long time. Sometimes I would bring a group and guided retreat. Sometimes I would just do my own thing. And then finally, in 2006, I got to a point in my life when I was able to move here and live here full time. And since then, I've just devoted myself to sharing the mountain with people from around the world. And it's amazing to live here. You know, this the energy of the mountain. It just promotes peace and happiness. It's probably the simplest way to say it. Well, what a wonderful way to to live your life, to to have found a spot on Earth that you have a a real strong connection to, and then to be able to live there full time and then share it with people. It sounds like a really wonderful way to live. I am grateful every day, for sure. You know, there are all sorts of, of legends associated with Mount Shasta, right? Things like, you know, the various Native American tribes hold it in high regard. There's Uh, the Lemurian legend. What is your take on all that? My favorite way to describe Mount Shasta, it's a 14,000-foot mirror that reflects back the deepest truth in your heart. So everybody who comes here experiences that reflection. They feel something deep inside, and they interpret it according to whatever beliefs they're carrying with them. It kind of speaks to your own inner spirituality, no matter what it is. Very much so. You know, the name Shasta comes from a Russian word, Shastya, which means happiness. And some of my Russian clients have said it's not just normal happiness. It means like eternal happiness or pure happiness. And the way it got that name is that after the gold rush, when people from all over the world were coming here to look for gold, and I don't think it was gold on Mount Shasta, but there was gold as close as Wairika, which is just 30 miles up the road. So some of the people who came looking for the gold were Russians, and they saw the mountain, they felt this energy, the energy I've been talking about, and they said, and I feel this incredible happiness. And so that name became slightly anglicized and it became Mount Shasta. So this is really the mountain of eternal happiness. And people really do find that here for real. Well, I think we can all use a little more happiness nowadays. Yeah, I think bottom line, everybody wants happiness. And a lot of people are trying to get happiness by getting more stuff or better job or, you know, they're looking for how to happiness in, in the outer world. And I think when you come to Mount Shasta, you, you remember that the happiness is already inside of you and you don't need a bigger house or more money in your bank account, you can just be happy right now just by relaxing and focusing into your heart more deeply. It almost sounds like for many people, a journey to Mount Shasta is almost like a pilgrimage. Is that kind of a fair assessment? Uh, I'd say very much so. I mean, it's, it's a place you can go where you can really come home to yourself. It's a place you can come where you can 
just release all the cares of the world, all the stresses and pain you may have accumulated, and just come back to your original true nature, which to me is peace and goodness and innocence. So I would definitely consider that a pilgrimage for sure. Now, I, I consider myself a fairly spiritual person, and you know I love to commune with nature, but I'm probably quite conventional compared to some of your guests. Uh, for instance, I love like the sensation I get from being deep in a redwood grove, but I don't meditate or anything like that. Do you think somebody like me would get value out of one of your tours? Yeah, 100%. I mean, first of all, we'd be visiting incredibly beautiful places. And second, I think if you're not experienced in meditation, I offer guided meditation, and that, I think that would help you to go deeper and just receive deeper the energies and the gifts of the mountain and the special places I would take you to. Do you find that people who've never meditated before kind of take to it quickly on a, on one of your tours? Honestly, I prefer to take out people who are kind of newbies and don't have a lot of concepts and experience. And sometimes when you're just new and you're fresh and open, you can actually receive more, you know, than if you've been meditating 40 years and think you know everything. Who are your typical guests? I mean, do they come from the other side of the country, the other side of the world? You know, I'd say it's a very global audience that comes to Mount Shasta. I'd say probably more baby boomers than anything else. And what are they typically looking for on these adventures? Are they looking for enlightenment, uh, a reset? Uh, is there a lot of variation among your guests? The one word I would say to start with that's most universal is connection. I think everybody's wanting connection and everybody's wanting that reset, you know, the chance just to release the accumulated stress. And, you know, life almost everywhere in this planet is stressful and challenging and people just need a chance. Occasionally, I say at least once a year is a pretty good rhythm just to clean everything out, just like a computer needs a reset to dump out all the gunk that accumulates. I think us human beings need a reset also. Yeah, that sounds good to me. <laughs> I'd love to get a sense of a few of the different tours that you offer so we can give listeners a sense of, of what to expect. Can you explain some of the differences and, and share some of the details? I can walk you through a typical tour. So I often like to start with a waterfall. There's a kind of off the beaten track waterfall I love that I feel is a great place for the reset we just talked about a moment ago. It's a place where it's very cleansing. The energy of the falls is very strong. And I like to do a Hawaiian prayer there. That's also a prayer for reset. And the combination of the energy of the falls and the energy of the prayer is I'd say it's very synergistic. Almost everybody experiences feeling very refreshed, lighter, freer, happier after that. And that would be about maybe a half hour walk round trip to the falls and back. Maybe first we'd go to a place in the woods. It's very peaceful, serene place, great place for dropping in deep and having a very peaceful, calming meditation. Then maybe we drive a little higher up and a little higher up there's an incredible rock formation. It's physically it's pretty amazing. And energetically, it's very powerful. And there's actually a little small cave in the rock formation, which is a great meditation spot. And then maybe from there, we drive higher up the mountain. And there's another spot that's over 8,000 feet I love. It's above the tree line. Just see an incredible, inspiring 360 view. And I like to do visioning there. Since, you know, for me, a complete journey is past, present, and future. So after cleaning out the old energies renewing the connection in the present, the final piece is opening the vision for the future. So I found this high spot with the inspiring vistas, a great place just to, from a very expanded kind of top of the world, above the human drama place, to look at your life and get inspiration for next steps. I must say, just hearing you describe it is, is making me feel really calm and serene right now. So I can only imagine experiencing it, how, how you would come out feeling. Yeah, most people feel fantastic afterwards. You know, most people are just extremely happy and feel very clear and feel a fresh sense of inspiration about their life. How big a group do, do you usually have on these tours? It varies from one to 45. A lot of times I do one-to-one -one or for a couple or for two friends to come together. And I have a fair number of groups, say in the eight to 20 range. And just occasionally I get really big groups like, you know, 30, 40, 50. How important is physical fitness? Do your guests need to be mountain climbers to go on these tours, or do you have easier and more difficult tours? Yeah, you know, most of the tours are very easy. A lot of my favorite places are accessible with a hike of 10 minutes or less, and often those hikes are pretty level. Some of them do have uphill, but, you know, I'd say if someone's even an average or even somewhat below average physical condition, we can design an itinerary that'll, that'll work for them. 
Now, I noticed on your site that you also offer week-long tours. How did they unfold? It definitely goes a lot deeper. I mean, you can do some great work in one day and really finish a day feeling fantastic. But if you have a whole week, I'd say it's more integrated and more sustainable. So that's one of the advantages of doing a full week or even three days. There's more chance I think you'll be able to keep the momentum going when you get home. And certainly in a week, we have a chance to go to a lot more places than we would in a day. And, you know, there's just loads of fantastic off-the-beaten spots that I know about that can take people. So we do not run out of places or get bored in at least in a week. It just gets better every day. You know, it's really so great to learn about all this, Andrew, and and I'm more than a little intrigued. I'm curious, what do you enjoy about taking people on these tours? I'm guessing you derive some personal joy from sharing these these sacred sites with travelers. First of all, I love the mountain, and that's why I live here. That's why I guide people here, since I really do have a deep love for the mountain. So just being on the mountain and being in these special places is always a joy for me. Second, I've always really had a passion for helping people to grow and to learn and to open. So that's very fulfilling for me. And I'd also say that when I guide meditations, I'm having the experience too. A long time ago, I learned how to be effective at guiding meditations. And the key is not just to be saying the words, but be having the experience. So when I'm guiding people on the mountain, I'm getting to to meditate. I'm getting to go deep myself. So it's really amazing. You know, I get to go to my favorite places in the world. I get to serve people. I get to have deep experiences and I even get paid for it. It sounds really wonderful. And I really loved learning more about Mount Shasta and the tours that you lead. Um, Thanks so much for joining us on California Now. You're welcome. My pleasure. Andrew Ozer has been exploring the sacred side of Mount Shasta for 40 years and can take you to some magical places, whether you're seeking spiritual awakening or maybe just some beautiful natural scenery. Go to his site, mountshastaretreat.net. That's mtshastaretreat.net for more information. And be sure to go to our site, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast for links to everything we mentioned today. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. Please subscribe and please let us know how we're doing by leaving feedback on our podcast. We read it all and we'd absolutely love to hear what you think about California Now, including which topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes. In today's episode, we started out down in San Diego, ventured north to the town of Bishop, and then continued on to Mount Shasta up near the Oregon border in Siskiyou County. In just three segments, we covered more than 820 scenic miles within the Golden State. The point I'm making? California is a huge place and a wonderful destination to explore by car. If that sounds like a fun way to travel, you're in luck. We've assembled a beautiful collection of road trip itineraries that'll help you plan your next adventure here. Go to Amazon and look for California Road Trips, 50 Life-Changing Adventures. It will immediately transport you into trip planning mode. See you soon.